Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and I'm joined today by a special friend, a colleague of mine here at uh, the University of the Americas Puebla in Mexico, Dr. Mohamed Adin Eliatiwi. Uh, uh, Mohamed, welcome and welcome back to Global Connections, and thank you again for joining me. Uh, today we have a topic we're going to explore that really doesn't get a lot of attention in the international community. Uh, the media, uh, partly we have a lot of other things happening in the world, but it's a, it's a crisis that's been unfolding for quite some time, a number of decades now. It is in northwest Africa, basically the western Sahara region. Uh, and uh, I want us to maybe provide initially some of the context, but maybe as we continue understanding this issue, you know, how does it reflect, I guess, either the challenges of uh, these kind of uh, separatist movements, uh, you know, multi-ethnic, multiracial uh, societies, we're talking about Morocco uh, and more specifically the Western Sahara, where there's a region that has been under some dispute for a while, uh, and there's been a movement now, right, uh, almost approaching 40 years, known as the Polisario, a front uh, that is trying to seek, I guess, a, a separate state or, or some independent. Uh, so before I add any more to that, uh, maybe uh, let me stop and have you give us a quick snapshot. What is this issue of, uh, well, we're calling it, you know, in some ways it, it deals with uh, terrorism and, and organized crime, because uh, like many of these national liberation movements, they kind of go through changes and they become different actors. Uh, but tell us a little bit about the context about what we're talking about here. It's what's the Sahara. We have, of course, Morocco that borders uh, Mauritania to the south. It has Algeria to the east and just south of the European continent. Uh, but what is going on here? And uh, um, tell us a little bit to inform our, our listeners about it. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. So, what is really interesting in this case, we have a conflict that is been since uh, 44 years, yeah. and uh, in a region we is not uh, talking a lot about. Yeah. Because we can see that this conflict, in reality, is a conflict of the decolonization of Africa, mm -hmm. a conflict of a, co of a Cold War, who is continuing yeah. uh, 27 years, 38 years after the end of the Cold War. So so it's in some ways, it's a legacy of that. It kind of hasn't been resolved. Yeah. We had this brief, obviously, in both the decolonization uh, uh, that process that unfolded after the 60s and just continued, but also the Cold War ends, and that exactly. right. remains kind of a, exactly. an issue. It's the legacy of the Cold War and the legacy of colonialism. Um, the Sahara was the Spanish Sahara mm -hmm. in the end of the 19th century, in 1975. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, it was a more territory. And the whole the debate is that in 1973, the Polisario was created as a movement of liberation of the Sahara against the Spanish. Okay. And in 1976, after the Green, Green March, when Morocco recuperated the Sahara to the Spanish, the March organized by the King of the Southern, mm -hmm. and Morocco recuperated to the territory of the Sahara, that this moment the Polisario. One year after Mauritania, create the RAP, the Republic Arabic Sahrawi Democracy. So, at yeah, issue here, you've got a country that sort of proclaims its own independence, actually gets recognized by a number of other countries, right? Uh, yes, of all places, and then a number of other uh, different uh, actors throughout the world. But basically, it's a contested one because not everybody, and yet it does have so one of these very. Great the Arabian areas. recognized uh, the RAP, but the UN did not. Oh, okay. It's really interesting yeah. because we have each year, each year a lot of countries who recognize this uh, mm -hmm. representation and now no. So it's interesting because we are living the legacy of the 70s and the 80s. And we have the evolution of a Marxist group, because it's a Marxist group, yeah, yeah. who was uh, financed by Libya with Gaddafi. Yeah, the old with, Libya. Exactly, the old Libya with Gaddafi. And by Algeria. Mm. Algeria is one of the main actors of the situation. Algeria, the government of Algeria, is Boumedienne and Bouteflika, who are the foreign secretary of state mm. at this moment, are appealing the Polisario, but they didn't want to participate to the negotiation. So we didn't have nothing to do with that. We don't have any relation. But the reality is that they have a relation, a really close relation. And what is interesting is. In 1975 to 1991, there was a conflict between the Polisario and the Moroccan army in 1991. And the UN in 1991 gave them in also to have a ceasefire, yeah. and this ceasefire is today. But all the problems 
of the discussion is that Algeria is saying the, Sah the Western Sahara needs not a uh, referendum of auto determination. Well, Morocco is saying it's not possible. Because Morocco at the beginning accepted the, the idea of the referendum of auto determination, but it was not possible to have an agreement about who can participate. So the idea of Morocco, of the King Mohammed VI, the son of Hassan II, is to say we have, we're going to propose an autonomy. So they would remain an integral part of Morocco, but have that relative autonomy in that unified. A relative autonomy yeah. inside the kingdom of Morocco. But I think it's all the idea. you've already touched on the reality. Here's one of these complex issues that has a lot of different players: Algeria, perhaps the legacy of Libya, which of course is Gaddafi now is in a you know different form of chaos, but it has a, an impact, uh, or it obviously had a role in the early days. Moreover, this early, uh, this was known as the Polisario, this uh, movement. Uh, begin the Marxist inspired, as you mentioned, uh, the national liberation movement. Um, you know, we live in an age now, is in the post Cold War period, where we often see a lot of emphasis on issues of ethnicity, identity, separateness, uh, sovereignty. Uh, and here again, it's an ongoing uh, example. You describe how, on one hand, this uh, this was known as the uh, uh, Sadr, the the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. So this is a region of essentially Western Sahara part of what Morocco would say is Morocco that is declaring itself independent. And it gets recognized by a number of states, I think out of 40 or something, um, including the Africa Union, which is a regional organization representing, you know, African countries, but not the United Nations. So it's kind of, you know, uh, inconsistent, complicated, many players. Uh, and, uh, of course, this group, uh, this group known as the Sahrawi, what, what could you tell us quickly about them? Uh, because like so many groups, they're probably spread across borders as well. So, if we are talking about the Sahari population, the Sahari population is Mauritania, Morocco, Nigeria, and a lot of countries. Yeah. So, the creation of the Sahari population, the creation of the Spanish people, because the Spanish government, before to leave the country, they didn't accept the idea of a recuperation of the territory by Morocco. So, they promoted the Sahari Okay. So, so some of it is the void that, you know, that Spain, which used to have claim over this area as a colony, suddenly wants to kind of define those terms. But Morocco, meanwhile, is saying, well, wait a minute, no, this is part of our country now. Uh, and so you've got uh, pushing uh, identity issues uh, to create this new separate republic that is not recognized either by the UN or by Morocco. It's very really interesting to, to see that a lot of countries who recognize this. Uh, group mm -hmm. now are again this group. In Latin America, who is recognizing this group? Cuba and Venezuela. In Mexico. But you have Cuba and Venezuela. Because it's a Marxist group, historically, that has the Wall Street Journal told last Sunday, we had an evolution of this group since 15 years. We had the implementation of terrorist methods of one part of this group and it's a more organized crime because we know that, for example, the European Union, a lot of NGOs are pulling this uh, polisario, yeah, yeah. and we have corruption, we have arms traffic, we have drug traffic, and since 15 years old, we have the constitution of terrorist attacks, not only against the Moroccan army, but against, for example, in the 80s, beginning in the 80s, we the use of terrorist attacks against the Spanish workers in the Sahara. A lot of Spanish groups, Spanish companies, had contracts with the Sahara, in the Sahara and they used terrorist attacks against them. So it's a Marxist group. That has evolved, and, and, and like often like happened, the, uh, you, you had this similar, like the FARC in Colombia, who began with you know ideological focus and, and, and you know, inspiring a revolution with you know, inspired by the Cuban Revolution, supported by external actors. But over time, a lot of these problems are morphing into essentially uh, uh, extortion and, and organized crime, and, and essentially then using organized uh, tactics that would be labeled terrorists by other groups. And so it's interesting because we, we associate acts of terrorism primarily with the, the Gulf region, the Middle East, uh, and here's a region kind of far remote from that, far western uh, uh, North Africa, uh, and, and yet it remains a bit of a hot spot. Uh, and you've got a number of players, outside actors. Tell us a little bit about the context of maybe what, what you described a little bit, which is in more recent years, it's 
been evolving now to become maybe a potential threat. I mean, who is that risk there, or, or who is maybe supporting the different interests? So what is interesting is that in the Sahara and the Sahel, we have a lot of terrorism. One of the most famous is the Akhmi al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, mm -hmm. who is uh, in reality the, the Algerian GSPC of the civil war of Algeria, who changed its name in yeah. 2007. And the same part, color of their exactly. fire. And they are part of the Al-Qaeda connection. But it's really interesting to see that uh, members of the Polisario and young members of the Polisario now uh, are close of ISIS, are close to ISIS and to ACNI. Because we have not only the same ideology, uh, like this ideology, but we have to the connections between organized crime. And it's interesting because Sahara and Sahel uh, is one of the regions of the world where, the, where you have a lot of connections between organized crime, the trafficking, uh, human trafficking, etc., and terrorist groups. And in one group, you can have both. So it's really interesting to see this evolution of narco terrorism. Yeah. And it's interesting, like part of it is a marriage of convenience, part of it is a marriage of, you know, basically, you could say either ideology or what they do. And it's interesting, you know, we look at, at, at you know, this is a region that's obviously been under contestation for some time, but now in this more recent era, you have the use of technology that helps both connect these groups with others, uh, with shared interests, uh, social media, uh, but also even something as simple as the use of cell phones and, and otherwise satellite technologies that allow them to organize and move. And, you know, it's fascinating to see because this is a part of the world, basically we're talking about the Sahara Desert, where the borders are not so clearly defined. There's not, a, not necessarily a big, uh, obvious uh, river or mountain that, 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 that separates it. And yet there are clearly is an understanding of who, you know, who this belongs to and who that. Uh, but here, this region still finds itself under dispute. It's a complicated region because we have the war in Libya. 2011, in 2013, the war in Mali, really close from the Sahara, and really close from the Algerian Sahara and the Moroccan Sahara, yes. and from Mauritania. And we have an instability in Mauritania since 30 years, 30 years old. So it's really complicated. And all the debate today is to see if the international community, the UN, can accept the constitution and the creation of the new state in this region. Yeah. Morocco said it's impossible for two reasons. For the historical reasons, Morocco considers it's part of its territory, and for security reasons, because you will have narco state, you will have federal state uh, close to Morocco, in its borders, and in Africa. So it will be a really a big problem. That's why the Wall Street Journal said that the Trump administration wants to have a solution to this conflict since 40 years old, and a lot of the members of the Trump administration are saying that the independence is not a solution. It can be, it can be a solution because it will create new problems in a region that has a lot of problems. So the only one solution, viable solution, is the autonomy. Yeah. It's the autonomy. And, and it's essentially keeping it within the territorial integrity of Morocco, yes. allowing it some measure of autonomy. What is proposing Morocco and the King uh, Mohammed uh, is, is to have representatives of the Saharan population in the national parliament, Rabat, okay? more another parliament in the Sahara, a local parliament, yeah. and to have an autonomy of the culture, the language, and a lot of education, a lot of things, but to have respect the sovereignty of Morocco. Defense or in Afros, in Morocco. Yeah, yeah. But all the local life and the, the life with the education, health, yeah, yeah. etc., it will be the Sahari, Sahari who will be the uh, main actors. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting to see that uh, this conflict is doing since 40 years old, and we have Algeria is not proposing nothing. The police are saying we want to create a state, and what is really interesting is that the police are we are democrats, but it's a unique party, like all the Marxist yeah. uh, groups. It's a unique party. You don't have any uh, election in the party. The leader, Raheem Gadi, is 
a leader who has a lot of problems with the Spanish justice for human rights, they sort of abuse him, and you have uh, a civil speech. They said they are democrats, but they don't want to participate in local elections or to national elections in Morocco. So it's something really strange. Yeah, yeah. In 2019. And, and again, and here, it's interesting because we live in a time in the world now where most of the world, we could say, has been sort of carved up and decided, and, and yet there are, like this one, a number of places where there are still some issues to be resolved, and, and this place has had a number of different peace initiatives, brokers, uh, the United Nations, uh, and different occasions, other you know, regional players. Uh, I think it, it mostly shows us the challenge of these very complex, multi-party, multi-ethnic uh, issues that are not easy to resolve uh, because there are different interests. Uh, what about this group itself, this uh, this uh, Sahrawi, Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic is one thing, but is the ethnic group itself spread beyond that, or is it concentrated just in that region itself? So what is really interesting is that the members of the police are living in single Algeria. And that they have, like, safe haven of protection there? What happens is that a lot of the population, the Moroccan Sahrawi, are Living in the Moroccan Sahara, in Layoun, Maran, Bastayan, Gulgur, Zahla. But one part of them are in Tindu, and the leaders of the police are in Tindu. And if one Sahara will say, I want to come back to Morocco, it won't accept. We have a, a bigger street for the problem. So the members of Polisario are flying with an Algerian passport. So it's really interesting to see that. And it's really interesting to see that these people, I think they will represent the Sahrawi, didn't accept any election to see who represents the Sahrawi. Morocco is saying, you can have a local parliament. You will have free elections. But they are saying, we are the only representatives of the Sahara. It's really interesting. The other part is that a lot of people are leaving for her in Lyon. They are not from the Sahara history, but from the part of Morocco. The Bolivia is saying that we don't want that these people stay in this region because it's only for the Sahara. So it's a really close uh, vision of the identity. It's really interesting to see that because we have an international movement who has the benefit of uh, Venezuela, Cuba, all the international revolution. But in reality, it's a movement who is uh, defending a notion, a notion of identity, identity really strange in uh, the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. And again, here, it just underscores the complexity of the industry. Uh, a, a protected conflict that has many different actors and players. It has, a, like everything, a historical context. You cannot understand this without going back to understand what role the Spanish had as a, a previous colony. Morocco, as it establishes itself as a new state, uh, or, you know, redefining its territorial borders, uh, and then these other neighbors that have been players from Algeria, even Mauritania, with its own problems, of course. Yeah, now, as an issue of the Cold War, I mean, uh, what, if any, what uh, legacy or impact is, is played out there? And maybe more specifically, are there, is there an influence from other outside actors? I mean, in the old days, the Soviet Union, U.S., everything played out that way. In more recent times, uh, so at the historical level, we have uh, the U.S. who are defending Morocco, but not so much. France, in reality, was a member of the Security Council who is defending Morocco. And further, from another part, the Soviet Union was doing a lot at Algeria. And today, what we can see that is that France is still defending the uh, Moroccan position, and Russia. Is not with the Polisario, but they are neutral since a few years. But we have every, every time this week have Russia defending the auto determination. Yeah. So the consequences of the Cold War, and we have a big problem because, for example, China in a clear position about. But what is really interesting is that this conflict divides a, a lot Africa and Latin America and Latin America. So it's really interesting to see that all the left groups or all the left 
Latin government in uh, Latin America. Cuba, Venezuela, Venezuela Bolivia. Yeah. Like, we are defending the police side. And we can see that it's a conception of democracy. I think really strange. Yeah. And uh, what is a, a problem is that, for example, Mexico in 1979 is recognizing this group. So it's a big problem for the bilateral relations between Morocco and Mexico. That's a delicate issue. It's, That's a, issue. it's a really delicate issue. Yeah. So it's interesting to see that Mexico has still the same position in 1979, and in Mexico, a lot of things changed mm -hmm. in 40 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. And when uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador the current president of began, Mexico, yeah. began as president the 1st of December, he invited the leader of the Polisario, Brahim Gali. And it's interesting because Mexico is still talking about human rights in the foreign policy. And they invited Brian Ali has a lot of problems with Spanish justice, with a case of rape and abusing. Mm -hmm. So it's a, something really strange that we are living at an international level. We have a conflict of a colonization with him, a conflict of a Cold War is still there, and we have some positions are not changing. And Mexico changed a lot of positions of its foreign policy, but not this one. Now, back to the, maybe just to bring some closure and then understand maybe the, the current geopolitical and, and you know, organized crime and terror element. Um, the group is, itself, this Polisario, which is, you know, the group kind of leading this separatist movement, um, what would you describe or, or what would you say about I mean, actions that they've been taking that are now clearly linking them more to organized crime, more to terrorism? So, what we know uh, is the European Commission. Uh, said last year that we have, because it was an investigation, that we have links between drug trafficking, arms traffic, between the Polisario and some uh, narco groups or organized crime groups in the Sahel and in the Sahara. Mm -hmm. So we know that. And we know that, for example, last year, too, in 2018, two people from ISIS were arrested in Morocco, and in reality, um, all members of the Polisario to change or ISIS. Mm -hmm. So we have this connection in the Sahel, in the Sahara. And the biggest risk for Morocco is that the Polisario connected itself with some members of ISIS to have a planification of terrorist attacks in the Kingdom of Morocco. It's the biggest uh, turn uh, attack. Yeah. And the other problem is that Algerian government didn't want to go, didn't want and didn't want to cooperate uh, about counter terrorism uh, measures against that. So we don't have an efficient cooperation between two neighbors in the case of terrorism because we have this regional conflict in more than 40 years. So it's a big problem. And the relation between the Polisario and terrorist group. Is now since 15 years old. And it's interesting to see that in the European Union, the groups who are defending the Polisario are, for example, Podemos in Spain. It's the movement that recently come up. Exactly. The Parliament of the Iglesia, who is really close to the Venezuelan regime. So we have this connection in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, for example, in South Africa. Jacob Suma, when he was president, was one of the biggest supporters of the police uh, Interesting. Well, I, mean, I think as we've come to see in this very complex issue, it has many factors that are kind of issues that make it both more challenging and protracted. There are many players, many layers happening in different levels. Uh, there's a historical legacy that often is deeply rooted in that. And it reflects, again, the kind of conflict that we see throughout many parts of the world in this post war period, post post war period. And that is, Focused on ethnic, on identity, on uh, you know either one group that wants to be free of, of, of that, or the challenge and ultimately the solution in some places. Look, where do you find a you know a formula that provides a power sharing arrangement, a form of you know relative autonomy? You can have the local parliament and control over culture and everything like that, uh, but allowing the larger state in the Morocco control of the territory, the foreign policy. 
anti-terrorism, etc. I think it, it can be the, the best solution because in reality, Morocco, Morocco can accept the creation of a new state. Uh, we have the problem of stability of the region, and it's the only solution we can respect the rights of the population and the rights of the state, and also the stability of the region with terrorist attack, organized crime, etc. It's the only one solution because no one proposed it, yeah. only Morocco. And I think the negotiation can uh, permit to have a solution. We have uh, a lot of meetings between the Moroccan government and some representative of the police with the UN in Geneva and in New York. And all the UN members say Morocco came with proposition, and the police said no. And when the UN members told the police are what do you want? Independence. So we have the same speech in Sports Union. Yeah. Now we'll close on that, and I thank you for giving us this quick overview. But I'm reminded actually, it's been a couple of weeks when they announced the um, verdict of uh, a very tragic incident that happened, I think it was some months ago, earlier this year, uh, the gruesome murder of some tourists that were coming from Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they were even headed. It was rather gruesome. Was this in any way connected to this time group, or was that some? No, that was up in the no, north no, no, part. Yeah, it was. And uh, Moroccan members of IT. Yeah, it was yeah. really yeah. different. Yeah. Different but The problem of uh, with the police because we have to attack in the Moroccan Sahara against policemen or against soldiers. Mm -hmm. So another problem. It remains still a hot issue. Well, thank you again, uh, Mohammed, for an opportunity to dialogue about this. It uh, underscores, again, the enduring uh, sort of geopolitical realities of the world. Even the end of the Cold War still has some of these legacies there. Uh, and just the challenge of sovereignty, of, of territorial integrity, and you know, national self-determination. These are powerful issues that still live up here today. Uh, here's a protected conflict in the Western Sahara that uh, let's hope it uh, over time gets resolved in a way that you know, can meet the different interests uh, because it's never easy. There's no single simple solution to it that as you could get. While Morocco has been putting cards on the table, the other side at this point continues to have a pretty firm position saying, no, we want independence. But that's not as easy as, as one would like to see. Uh, well, thanks again, and I think we'll close on that, uh, this opportunity to join here on Global Connections, uh, joined today by Dr. Mohamed Adina El Yassi. Uh, and, you see you and, and thank you for this thank insight, you. and we'll continue the dialogue on the next chance. Thank, thank you, our you. listeners, for joining us here on Global Connection. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Uh, join us again for the next episode coming up soon.